Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath, though it's not Sabbath here yet. But um, uh, before we begin our study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord, for the Sabbath hours, for the fellowship with Christ and with others, the true believers, those that are seeking to know the truth, that are recognizing their need of you, and the encouragement we receive as we fellowship together. We just pray, Lord, for your spirit's presence to be here as we again read from A.T. Jones, a message from long ago that has relevance today and addresses the need that we have at this time as we see the things in the world happening around us. The need that we have of Christ, of his righteousness, that we can be your witnesses upon this earth, of the power of the cross. And we just pray, Lord, that you can help us to, to understand the things we read, to apply them to our lives, and to experience um, the joy of salvation. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Again, happy Sabbath. Um, now, before we start reading Jones, I just have a comment. I was, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I watch a lot of things on YouTube, a lot of religious material. I watch uh, documentaries dealing with archaeology. I watch um, lots of different discussions. Um, I will watch some of uh, Jordan Peterson's material. He has a series on the Exodus, which I've watched part of. Um, it's not the complete series right now that they have available, but I guess they're supposed to at some point. Um, and there was a discussion that had gone on um, there um, regarding uh, Judaism and Christianity, some of the differences. And there was also uh, Ben Shapiro had a discussion with Russell Brand um, regarding the same topic. And I was watching a, a reaction video. Somebody was reacting to Christian, uh, can't remember the guy's name, on YouTube. He was reacting to this conversation between Ben Shapiro and Russell Brand. Now, um, and this is relevant to our understanding of righteousness by faith. So one of the things Ben Shapiro said in, and uh, is that the difference between Christianity and Judaism. So Judaism focuses upon uh, the law as a way to become an experience uh, transcendence. That's the word they use, right? So this would be in the experience with God. Um, so we obey God's law. We don't have to believe it. We just, in, in obeying God's law, uh, we come to... Uh, experience God, right? This is the idea of Judaism, where he says that Christianity seeks the transcendent, this experience with God, first, so that they are able to keep the law. Now, of course, in these types of discussions, there can be, you know, so oversimplifications, uh, obviously, between Judaism and Christianity. Now, what does this remind us of? in the Bible. Well, I'm thinking of, of Paul when he says, says that in Romans 7, while well, he was saying that he could not in himself keep God's law, that sin was so ingrained in him that though he wanted to be holy, wanted to keep the law, he just did not have the power without Christ. Right. Now, part of that comes from a difference between uh, the Christian idea of what righteousness is compared to the modern Jewish idea of what righteousness is. Right. And, and we're going to see this issue come up in 
um, Jones uh, discussion, right? And, and it has also in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin. Because um, for a Jew, um, such as Dennis Prager, who's discussing with Jordan Peterson, you know, that, uh, that righteousness, he has a very low standard of righteousness. I mean, he doesn't believe that the thoughts and intents of the heart um, have anything to do with sin, which, of course, is completely ridiculous. I mean, we know that um, if you just clean the outside of the cup and inside it's full of dead man's bones, that um, ult ultimately a person could keep the law externally for a time, but because he has an unchristlike character, he will end up rejecting righteousness um, and justify it at a time uh, when it's inconvenient, right? So, so obviously we need a changed heart. And, and this is an Old Testament idea. So to say that, you know, um, that the Old Testament or Judaism teaches this. I mean, modern Judaism teaches this. And definitely Judaism in the time, time, time of Christ taught this idea. Now, um, but we also think about when we, we talk about being justified by faith, right? So there is, um, in Romans 3, verse 28, where Paul concludes that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, right? But we know that James says, you see how the man, that man that by works man is justified and not by faith only. And some people see these as a contradiction, right? So we have two statements that on the surface appear to be contradictory. James' statement that man is not justified by faith only. That man is justified by works, right? So Jonah says uh, here, he's, he's, he's got a spirit of prophecy quote here from uh, third um Selected Messages 172. The third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The com commandments of God have been proclaimed, but the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed. Um, why is this little box showing up? I don't want that little box. Okay. Uh, by Seventh day Adventists, as of equal importance, so um, the law and the gospel go going hand in hand. I cannot find language to express this subject in its fullness, right? So we know um, that these two things go together. That is, and, and, and the argument that Ben Shapiro uses is he says the problem with Christianity is they, they can have this transcendent experience, but... Uh, they can set aside the law, right? So they just have this experience and they downplay the law. And, um, and we can see that within Christianity. People have all kinds of religious experiences but have no interest in God's commandments. Um, but when we look at Paul and James, we know that they're not in contradiction with each other. They're looking at the problem because... Uh, from a different position. So James, uh, in chapter 2, he shows how um, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. So he talks about this just as Paul does. So both of them refer to this. But, but it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing how thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was his faith made perfect. Right? So he's not arguing with Paul. You need faith. But faith isn't going to uh, do anything other than uh, result in righteousness, in works of righteousness. But he's not arguing that, you know... Um, we just do works. He's not making the argument that Jen Sh Ben Shapiro made. Yeah, so 
so this is a problem that exists though within Adventism, right? So, I mean, it's not necessarily pertinent exactly to this discussion about the papacy, but it's going to show up later on. But we know that that the papacy in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin lectures that Jones shows that the papacy is is based upon works, man's righteousness. That we have to do something so that God will then accept us. Um, so, so this, this becomes really important. So we're going to see it as important as we go through this, but I just wanted to bring this up because this is just something that uh, I had experienced this past couple of weeks. i um, watching some of these videos. <clears throat> so we're going to begin re reading here. Um, so we did number one, of course, last week. Here he says, our lesson tonight will be the study of the papacy, as it was last night on the image of the papacy. I would say now, as then, all that I'm doing is, at present, is setting before you the evidence, stating the case. The arguments will come more fully after we see what is to be built upon them. The statements I shall read tonight will all be from Catholic authorities. Catholic speeches and Catholic papers. So, of course, the previous week we, he was quoting from Protestants. So he was dealing with uh, the image of the papacy. Now he's dealing with the papacy itself. First, I shall read from some of the Catholic speeches in the Catholic Congress in Chicago in 1893, printed in the Chicago Herald of September 5th, 6th, and 7th. They're simply parallel statements with those that were brought forth in the previous lesson from the other side, or rather from the other part of the same side. And by putting these together as we did, those others together and having the two lessons, it will be easy enough for you to mark the parallels, almost word for word, you will find in some of them. And they are identical in principle and in purpose. I will first read from an address de delivered to the Catholic Congress at Chicago, um, September 4th, on the influence of Catholic citizens by Walter George Smith, as published in the Chicago Herald of September 5th, 1893. The church, and, and I wish they would have had quotate, quotation marks here, because sometimes I'm not sure, but we know this is a quote here. The church and the state as corporations or external governing bodies are indeed separate in their spheres. And the church does not absorb the state nor does the state the church, but both are from God and both work to the same ends. And when each is rightly understood, there is no antithesis or antagonism between them. Men serve God in serving the state as directly as in serving the church. He who dies on the battlefield fighting for his country ranks with him who dies at the stake for his faith. Civic virtues are themselves religious virtues, or at least virtues without which there are no religious virtues, since no man who loves not his brother does or can love God. So um, that is in the same line you will remember with the statement of last night that nearer my God to thee and the star spangled banner are both Christian hymns to one that understands this thing. You can see that this makes the government wholly religious equally with the church. Then he's going to go on and quote again, the church, what he means is the Catholic church in all ages has been most democratic, the most democratic of all organizations. The church alone has taught the true theory of the fraternity and equality of all men before God. And to her precepts must mankind look for the foundation of their measures of relief from present dangers. And what he refers to is the present danger in social affairs, labor, against capital and the controversies at present rife in the United States. Now, um, I read a book, I can't remember the title of it, about a year or so ago, uh, dealing with uh, the economics of the Catholic Church. I just wish I could remember what the book was called. Um, uh, but it deals with how the papacy is actually, uh, it has been always socialist in its approach to economics. Um, so anyway, that's just an aside. Another statement from the same paper from a speech by Edgar H. Gans entitled The Catholic Church in America 
is published in the Chicago Herald of September 5th, 1893. Speaking of the spirit of liberty as exemplified in the United States and gathering the statement concerning the spirit of liber liberty from a quotation from Webster, the speaker says, the Catholic Church welcomes this bright and beautiful spirit and takes it to her bosom, for she is its foster mother. With tender devotion has she nourished it through the ages. Time and again has she rescued it from the bold and impious hands of despots, whether they be kings, emperors, or a popular majority enthroned. Within the Church of God is the only true sovereign, and the source of all power. The sovereignty of the people comes from him as a sacred trust, and they must use this trust for the common weal, right? which is good, the common good. Now, so the Catholic Church is um, the foster mother of the United States. It's an interesting idea. Um, but it's within the church of God is the only true sovereign and the source of all power. So um, I'm not sure what he means, whether he means the Pope, I would think so. Uh, I don't think he would be referring to Christ, um, but it, he could be, I'm not sure what, what he says behind that. Anyway, Jones goes, goes on. He says, we shall find presently from the Pope's encyclical that he in the place of God, is the guardian and source of the sovereignty. So he answers that question. So that only true sovereign is the Pope, not Christ. Now we read the closing statement of the same speech of Mr. Gans. The statement is identical with, with one which we read last night. Um, we have among us our prophets of Israel, divinely commissioned, as were the holy men of God, to guide, instruct, ennoble, and elevate the nation. The American people will have achieved their highest glory when they seek the words of wisdom and truth from their lips, when they voluntarily submit to the gentle ministrations of the priests and the bishops of the Holy Catholic Church. These statements need no comment. Your rec recollection of the statement we read last night will be clear enough to make the connection. We now read from a speech of Bish Bishop John A. Watterson of Columbus, in the Catholic Congress and published in the Chicago Herald, November 6th. His speech is upon Leo and Satoli. And he says th this, speaking of Leo, by his personal dignity and goodness, the practical wisdom of his teachings and the firmness of his acts, he is giving the world to understand that the Pope is the great thing in the world and for the world. I guess there was loud cheers. And intellects, therefore, rebellious are accustoming, the, accustoming themselves to think that if society is to be saved from a condition worse in some respects than that of pagan times, it is from the Vatican the Savior is to come. And then there's renewed cheering. So, so this is um, this speech. Now, of course... Um, there's lots we could comment on over that, but let's let's move on here. So another statement in the Herald of September 7th is by Catherine E. Conway. Her paper was entitled Making America Catholic. And she said this, your mission is to make America Catholic. This was Arch Archbishop Ireland's greeting to the assembled delegates at the Catholic Centenary Congress in Baltimore four years ago. And this was the charge with which he sent them back to their homes. Patriotic, patriotic and religious enthusiasm were at flood tide and all hearts were willing to respond like the first crusaders to the call of Peter the Hermit. God will it. Jones goes on. These addresses show that the aim and work of the papacy are precisely what those are of which we read last night. Um, now, this... Um, I mean, obviously, we know that the the aims of the papacy are the same. So in this time, the papacy is fairly bold, um, but in some ways ineffectual. That is, there's strong prejudice against the papacy. Now, we did have 
Now, some people here probably know a bit more about Vatican I and Vatican II. Um, now, Vatican I, what's the difference, I mean, besides when they occurred? What was the purpose of Vatican I? Um, and how does that differ from Vatican II? So they had the first Vatican Council. That's what it's called. It was in 1868, um, and it ended October 20, 1870. Anybody know anything about these? My understanding is that Vatican I seemed to be more about securing Catholic belief as the world was uh, changing. So it was sort of uh, digging in a little bit. I mean, that, that's my perception of what I've seen. I mean, that's where you're going to have um, um, the the statement that's going to be, they have this vote uh, on July 18, 1870. And what, that, what is that going to be about? Infallibility. Yeah, papal infallibility, right? So you're going to have this, um, you know, so they're, they're definitely digging in. But that's my impression. I haven't read, like, much about the First Vatican Council. But what about Vatican II? What was what was the purpose of Vatican II that we would probably know more about? Uh, from what I can remember from my teenhood, then the church was it was evolving more and more like the world, or at least in appearance to be more like the world more accepting, let's take the common language of the people instead of having the Latin mass and let's have the nuns dressed in modern clothing and the priests can take off their cassocks their if they want. You know, it was just like a kind of a free, fresh breeze blowing through the Catholic church. Right, so, and the idea there was, it was evangelistic too. Yeah. Right, I mean, that's uh, uh, engine music, and then we can see this um, in the 1960s with some of the shows that were, you know, there's the, you know, the, I mean, even there was a hit, Dominique, whatever it was called, Dominique, Nick, Nick, I don't know. You know, you had the singing mm -hmm. nuts. And, and there was just a lot for me growing up, you know, in the 60s and 70s, that there was this um, uh, maybe romanticism is another way of sort of describing it towards the Catholic Church. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the best way to describe it is, but it was, I mean, the church definitely now looked a little different and its, its face had changed. Um, so, so, you know, at this time, you know, this is, you know, so it was 1870, you know, so you're going to look at, you know, 25 years later is when they're uh, discussing these things now. Now, the Roman Catholic Church at that time is seeking to uh, evangelize because they want to make America Catholic. Um, but one of the things we know about Rome is Rome, how does it conquer? It doesn't go overthrow the gods that exist in the nations that it conquers. No, and it adopts their gods usually. Yeah. So it, it's it's synchronistic, right? That is, it mixes these things together. So, and that's why the Catholic Church can look quite different in different countries, uh, because you're going to see them 
adopting the customs of of the people wherever they go and and incorporating them into the catholic worship so that the person doesn't feel uh, you know sort of out of place you know it's not going to be like an italian uh you know catholic church if you're going to be in china or if you're going to be in some other place you know in a distant place in the world you're going to be incorporating those ideas those culture that culture and customs um and, and that's kind of what Vatican II does. So I don't know as much about Vatican I, but definitely um, what we do see is we do see them. And my, my perspective, little that I know about it, is that, that, they're, that it was much more um, uh, trying to preserve Catholic, the Catholic Church in, in a changing world. That's how I would look at it. But uh, there might be other ways to look at it. I haven't looked deeply into the decrees of the First Vatican Council. But anyway, I just brought that up as trying to get the context in which the Catholic Church here is acting compared to how it's acting today. So, I mean, we can see the Catholic Church is becoming uh, much more acceptable, accepting of uh, homosexuality and transgenderism um, uh, especially with the present Pope, he seems to be much more um, woke than we, we, than you know any previous Pope. <clears throat> okay. So he's going to read this from this encyclical uh, letter from Rome dated October 14th, 1894, printed in the Catholic Standard of November 3rd, 1894. The United States of America, it is, it can be said without exaggeration, is the chief thought of Leo XIII in the government of the Roman and Universal Catholic Church. I would like to comment a little upon this as we go along. So this is Jones. Uh, why is it that Leo thinks so constantly of the United States? Oh, it is concerning the government of the Roman and universal Catholic Church. Then what he proposes to use the United States for is for some purpose in the government of the Catholic Church throughout the world. Now, of course, for Jones to see this in 1894 is only because of our understanding of Bible prophecy. It would not be seen um, by many people in that day and age. <clears throat> he, um, now I think about uh, this. So, you know, we think about um, the Vatican and world politics by uh, Avril Manhattan that was written in, was it 1950? I'm trying to think the year he wrote that. Uh, I can't remember the year, but it's, it's in the 50s, 1950. And so, you know, that's only, that's closer to this time here than it is to our time today. And Avril Manhattan was writing about the papacy in the 1950s, 60s and on, um, at a time when we have uh, the understanding of Bible prophecy that um, Louis F. Weir is presenting. So what's going to happen you know, in 1989 in response to Daniel 11, verse 40b, um, so, so it's, it's kind of weird if you, if you can sort of think about this time, 1894, that it's definitely, you know, this is like 60 years uh, between before the 1960s. And we're definitely, well, I was born in 63 and I'm 60 now. So we're actually, he's actually closer to Avril Manhattan's writing about the Vatican and world politics than we are today. Um, <clears throat> But definitely 50, 50, 60 years after uh, Jones, you do have Avril Manhattan recognizing and seeing uh, what Jones was seeing 60 years earlier, 50, 60 years earlier. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so he says, I would like to comment a a little upon this as we go along. Why is it that Leo thinks so constantly of the United States? Right. So 
This is concerning the government of the Roman and Universal Catholic Church. That is, the, the papacy is proposes to use the United States for some purpose in the government of the Catholic Church throughout the world. So what is it about the United States that the papacy wants to utilize? Right? I mean, that's really the question. Why, why the United States and why does the papacy recognize this? So, so let's go on here. He says, he is one of the choice intellects of the old world who are watching the starry flag of Washington rise to the zenith of the heavens. A few days ago on receiving an imminent American, Leo XIII said to him, but the United States are the future. We think of them incessantly, incessantly. The inattentive politician, the superficial observer in Europe as in America is astonished at this persistent sympathy for the American people and care for its general interests, right? So this is not Jones. This is the, the, the paper that he's reading from, right? So the Pope is one of the choice intellects of the old world who's watching the starry flag of Washington rise to the zenith of the heavens. Now, I mean, for Americans, of course, they could see where they were going maybe to some degree in the 1890s because um, it definitely was uh, the future. Uh, but where America is now, I don't know if people could have seen what America is today. And so we would have to say what America is today is in part, um, I mean, it's, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. Right. So America became the the most powerful nation in the world and is still the most powerful nation in the world today. So anyway, this guy goes on a few days ago on receiving an imminent American. Leo the 13th said to him, but the United States are the future. We think of them incessantly. The inattentive politician, the superficial observer in Europe, as in America, is astonished at this persistent sympathy for the American people and care for its general interests. But those who know the ardent soul of the Pope, restless for what is good, eager for all that is great and fruitful, the philosopher who sweeps over the whole intellectual, social, and religious horizon, the statesman who judges matters by the light of central and governing ideas, these all read in the heart of the Holy Father the motives for his unbending resolutions and his devotion to American ideas. This ever-ready sympathy has its base in the fundamental interests of the Holy See. Now, the fundamental ideas of the Holy See are the ideas upon which the whole structure rests. The sympathy for America has its base in these fundamental ideas concerning the interests of the Holy See, of the Roman and Universal Church. This ever-ready sympathy has its base in the fundamental interest of the Holy See in a peculiar conception of the part to be played and the position to be held by the church and the papacy in the times to come, right? So you can see where Jones is going in his analysis of this. This is explained more fully presently that the papacy is watching the times to come with an all-absorbing interest, she proposes to prepare herself in every way to meet the things that are to arise, as she says, in the times to come. And she proposes to use the United States by which and through which to clothe herself and prepare herself to meet successfully these things that are to arise in the times to come. So I will read further upon the same point now. The interest is the necessity in which Rome finds she is to direct her general course according to the signs of the times and the transformations of the agitated surface of the world. The peculiar conception is the deep-rooted feeling that the Church of Europe must renew its instruments and its methods of adapting unchanging principles to changeable surroundings and new conditions. So the papacy never changes, does it? It, it is changeable to its surroundings and new conditions, but it's unchanging in its principles. 
So people see a different face of the papacy and they think that the papacy has changed, but it still operates on the same principles. So Jones goes on and quotes further, in this evolution, the church, in the eyes of the Pope, has a mission to fill. To fulfill this mission, she must adapt herself to the changes which have come about the action of universal forces, state church, official Catholicism, privileges, legal and close relations between two powers, connecting of the clergy with the political party, feudal ecclesiastical organizations, all the external framework of the church must be transformed, renewed, perhaps be done away with entirely. That is the central dominating thought which marks the whole latter half of the present pontificate from the time of the incidents of the Knights of Labor and the encyclical Rium Novarum to that of the encyclical to the French people. In the first half of the reign of Leo XIII had pacified, appeased, healed. Um, he had been the Pope of Peace and Rest. After sealing the charter, he became the Pope of Action. But how can this new type of ecclesiastic be created? So we can see exactly this is foreshadowing of the Vatican II Council, because that's basically what happened in Vatican II. You know, so... 60 some years after this. Um, so Jones goes on, where can he get the clergy, the form of ecclesiastic through which this scheme can be carried out and be made successful for Europe and for the world? Because Europe has to be rejuvenated, remodeled, re enlivened. Where is she going to get the model upon which to remold Europe? From whom shall he be copied? What civilization, what country, what philosophy will provide him? Would it not be hazardous to create him at one stroke? Now, I'm not sure sometimes whether I'm reading Jones, uh, talking about their thoughts or reading them. Would it not be better to join forces with a nation, nation that has a type in part where at least it exists in the rough? Would it not be enough to mark the outlines boldly to finish it and make use of it? This type is the American type. It is the American democracy with liberty, with common law, a full and exuberant life without restraining bonds and without a historic bureaucracy. <clears throat> um, the foundation of all endorsements of Sunday's laws in all the courts is the common law. Common law is the direct descendant of canon law. When the papacy was the state and the state was subject to the rules of the papacy, canon law was then what common law is now. And the states, which profess to have been separated from the papacy, still build up religious observances upon the common law. And now that the whole judicial structure of the United States is built in support of Sunday upon common law, the papacy steps in and is glad to find a model so ready, ready made to her hand upon which she can remodel her ecclesiastical forms for Europe and all the world. Now we can see here, you know, what Jones is saying is what is happening. Um, but in his day, it was still, there would be a lot that still would have to occur for that to be accomplished by the papacy. But it could have happened, right? If God's people had done their work, things would have moved more quickly. Another thing, I will read that sentence over. This type is the American type. It is American democracy with liberty, with common law a full and exuberant life without restraining bonds and without a historic bureaucracy. So Jones goes on and says, the papacy is very impatient of any restraining bonds. In fact, it wants none at all. And the one grand discovery Leo XIII has made, which no pope before him ever made, is that is that turn which is taken now all the time by Leo and from him by those who are managing affairs in this country, the turn that is taken upon the clause of the Constitution of the United States, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Leo has made the discovery that the papacy can be pushed upon this country in every possible way and by every possible means and that Congress is prohibited from ever legislating in any way to stop it. 
that is a discovery that he made that none before him made. And that is how it is that he of late can so fully endorse the United States Constitution. Interesting point there. We all know, of course, that that was intended to be the expression of the American people always, that religion should have no place in governmental affairs and no connection whatever with it. But the papacy is never satisfied without taking possession of everything in the government and running it in the interests of the church. And Leo XIII has found out that this can all be done under the cover of that constitutional statement, which was intended to prevent such a thing forever. Thus the papacy in plain violation of the constitution will crowd herself upon the government and then hold up that clause as a barrier against anything that would that, that any would do to stop it. And everyone that speaks against this working of the papacy, behold, he is violating the constitution of the United States in spirit because the constitution says that nothing shall ever be done in respect to any religion or the establishment of it. When a citizen of the United States would rise up and protest against the papacy and all this that is against the letter and the spirit of the Constitution, behold, he does not appreciate the liberty of the Constitution. We are lovers of liberty. We are defenders of the Constitution. We are glad that America has such a symbol of liberty as that. Indeed, they are. That is why Pope Leo XIII turns all his soul full of ideology or ideology to what is improperly called that's not no that idea idility full of how would you say that word idility anyway ideality idility to what is improperly called his american policy it should be rightly called his catholic universal policy What then is his policy in the United States? It is universal policy. That which is done in the United States by the papacy is done with the idea of influencing all the world and bringing all the world into line with the papal ideas and to build all once more upon the basic and fundamental principles thereof. It is in this respect, in this perspective, wide as a great world and lasting as a whole epoch that the coming American encyclical must be viewed to make the delegation of Satoli independent and sovereign, which he does with a Supreme Ecclesiastical Tribunal. And that means a great deal more than many people have dreamed of yet, for Satoli has already set forth the doctrine of the clergy in the United States, its doctrine that the clergy in the United States are not subject to civil jurisdiction. That means indeed a Supreme ecclesiastical tribunal to support Monsieur Satoli and make his mission permanent and successful to point out the means of increasing influence and liberty to continue the policy of moderation and adaptability which has brought peace to the nation to deal in a word with all the important questions of the day and to fix for good the ecclesiastical type the model of life which Neo the 13th wishes little by little, to bring within the reach of the weakening peoples of the old world, that is the sublime inspiration of the encyclical to the Americans. So Jones says, now this statement with, with reference to his watching the signs of the times, this recasting of the papacy, even undoing, if necessary, the establishments and the forms that have been in successful use for ages, All this in view of what the papacy is to do in the times to come reminds me of the Jews' translations of Daniel 8.23, where the authorized version says, in the latter time of their kingdom, when transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. The Jews' translation says, a king with an impudent face and understanding deep schemes. I want to know then if that does not point out the papacy as we are reading in right here tonight from these documents, a king of impudent face and understanding deep schemes. Of course, we know that this is actually referring to to pagan Rome in the time of Christ, but definitely pagan Rome is uh, the model for papal Rome. 
Bishop Keane, in his return from his visit to Rome last October, says in an interview published in the Catholic Standard of October 13, 1894, upon the same subject, Bishop Keane talked very freely about his recent trip abroad and especially about the great interest the Pope takes in America and the affairs of both temporal and spiritual of this country. The Pope believed the political welfare are properly, are, are properly the, te the temporal warfare, or properly the temporal warfare, political warfare, welfare, or temporal welfare. So it should be in... There should be commas there of the world to be guided by God equally with the spiritual welfare. So you got this political welfare, which is really the temporal welfare of the world are to be guided by God equally with the spiritual welfare. So this is what uh, Bishop Keene uh, talks about what the Pope believes. It is his policy to conciliate the two as much as possible in carrying out his purpose. The Pope wishes to adapt the church as much as possible to the existing conditions which characterize the world at present and to provide for those which characterize its future. The world he likens to the man in that the church represents the soul and the state, the body. A man would be foolish to cultivate the soul and pay no attention to the body. And likewise, the church cannot afford to take a cognizance of the conditions surrounding it. Um, for not to take cognizance of the conditions surrounding it. As the body of the man grows, his soul develops. And as the age of the world advances, the conditions surrounding the church are subject to equal changes. Consequently, it is the purpose of the Pope to keep the temporal power and the spiritual power from conflicting. The Pope then still holds his claim to be God's agents in conducting of these affairs. He sets up what he declares to be gods with respecting the church and respecting the temporal and spiritual powers. And then he is the one who, for God, is to manipulate them and say how they are to go on together. He is the one who is to keep them from conflicting. The Pope recognizes the fact that democracy is the coming state. And as such, the most prominent exponents today are France and America. Consequently, he regards these countries with a great deal of interest. This is especially true of the United States, where the Pope believes the stronghold of Catholicism of the future lies. Now turn to the words of the Pope in his encyclical, as published in the Catholic Standard of February 2, 1895. This encyclical um, needs to be read over several times before its real purpose is caught. Therefore, I have read these statements that preceded it, that you may catch the, qu the quicker what is said there upon this subject. Several points are discussed in it, but only what is said on this subject is what we shall now read. After addressing venerable brethren, health, and apostolic benediction, he says, we have now resolved to speak to you separately, trusting that we shall be, God willing, of some assistance to the Catholic cause among you. To this we apply ourselves with the utmost zeal and care because we highly esteem and love exceedingly the young and vigorous American nation in which we plainly discern latent forces for the advancement alike of civilization and Christianity. Speaking of the landing of Columbus, he says, like as the Ark of Noah surmounting the overflowing waters or the seed of Israel together with the remnants of of the human race. Even thus did the banks uh, or did the barks launched by Columbus upon the ocean carry into regions beyond the seas as well germs of mighty states as the principles of the Catholic religion. Now perchance did the fact which we now recall take place without some, some design of divine providence, so he must be still speaking, uh, precisely at the epoch when the American colonies having with Catholic aid achieved liberty and independence, coalesced into constitutional republic, the ecclesiastical hierarchy was happily established among you. Um, that is to say, just when liberty and independence were gained and this nation started, the ecclesiastical hierarchy of the Catholic Church was also started in this country. 
The two things belong to the same time. That is what he's pointing out. And at the very time when the popular suffrage placed the great Washington at the helm of the Republic, the first bishop was set by apostolic authority over the American church. So again, that's a quote. Joan says, these expressions are not put in there without a purpose. The papacy intends that the Catholic church shall be recognized as the American church henceforth. Again, I read, the well-known friendship and familiar intercourse which subsisted between these two men seems to be an evidence that the United States ought to be enjoined in concord and am amity with the Catholic Church. In another passage, after stating what the bishops did in their synods and by the decrees, he says, thanks are due to the equity of the laws which obtain in America and to the customs of the well-ordered republic for the church among you, unopposed by the Constitution. The Constitution, as it reads, was made for the direct purpose of opposing Rome and to save the country from the domination of Rome. Those who made the Constitution and the history of the time in which it was made said this, it is impossible for the man to judge the right of preference among the various sects that profess the Christian faith without erecting a claim to infallibility, which would lead us back to the Church of Rome, right? So we can see, you know, <clears throat> just to bring it up here, what is it that Parminder and Tess were teaching about the Constitution? Tyler as well. So what were they teaching about uh, the Constitution? What were they teaching about the papacy? I mean, it almost seems contradictory to some degree, but they look at the Pope as good, right? Pope Francis was a good Pope, right? That's what they said, yeah. Yeah. And, and they believe that the issues of the Sunday Law and the Constitution were really about uh, individual freedoms, but... You can see the problem with their thinking because the, the papacy is seeking to control the state. So you can't be talking about the papacy being a good thing and at the same time being supporting the constitution on the separation of church and state. But the papacy has managed to do that. They've managed to take the constitution and see it as a way as uh, to use it as to make inroads into controlling uh, the United States, contrary to the Constitution. And, and that would be contrary to uh, the principles of the Constitution as laid down by those that, that made the Constitution. So to keep the people of the country from the domination of the Church of Rome, they said in the Constitution, the government must never have anything to do with religion. But Leo has discovered that the lack of opposition in the Constitution is the Church's best hold, her greatest opportunity. For the Church among you, unopposed by the Constitution and the government of your nation, fettered by no hostile legislation, protected against violence by the common laws and the impartiality of the tribunals, is free to live and act without hindrance. So that's Pope Leo. And Joan says, and she is acting without hindrance. Now, I'm not saying that the Constitution should be in such shape that Congress could legislate, legislate against the papacy. Not at all. The surest safeguard against the papacy is the Constitution as it is. But under the circumstances, she is making that the surest means to the dominance of the papacy, she is making that the surest means to the dominance of the papacy. Leo continues, yet though all this is true, it would be very erroneous to draw the conclusion that in America is to be sought the type of the most desirable status of the church, or that it would be universally lawful or expedient for state and church to be, as in America, dissevered and divorced. 
Although the church has prospered under this constitution and has the finest chance and prospect of any place on earth, that is not to be taken as evidence that it is better to have the church and the state separate. Oh no, because before he gets done with, with this paragraph, he teaches that they shall be joined. Here are his words. The fact that Catholicity, Catholicity with you is in good condition, nay, is even enjoying a prosperous growth, is by all means to be attributed to the fecundity, fecundity, fecundity with which God, I see these words but never read them out loud, uh, with which God has endowed his church. Um, in virtue of which, unless men or circumstances interfere, she spontaneously expands and propagates herself, but she would bring forth more abundant fruits if, in addition to liberty, she enjoined the favor of the laws and the patronage of the public authority. <clears throat> so Joan says, it is not enough that she shall be free and unmolested. She must be favored and supported before she is satisfied. And although the constitution leaves her totally unfettered, that is not enough. And although she prospers under it, that is not enough. Nothing can satisfy but that she shall be supported and favored by the laws and the public authority. Now, as to the establishment of the apostolic delegation, that is, the position of Satoli, hear his words upon that. They are full of meaning, too. By this action, we have elsewhere intimated, we have wished, first of all, to certify that our judgment and affections, that in our judgment and affections, America occupies the same place and rights as other states, be they ever so mighty and imperial. By the establishment of Satoli's position here, Jones goes on, he proposes and says that, that America today, the United States, the United States occupies the same place and has the same rights as other states, however mighty and imperial they may be, as Austria, Spain, France, any of them, even as is said in this dispatch, which appeared in the Lansing, Michigan, in uh, Republican of September 24th, 1894. The papal rescript elevates the United States to the first rank as a Catholic nation. Heretofore, this country has stood before the church as a missionary country. It had no more recognition officially at Rome than had China. By the new rescript and by this encyclical also, the country is freed from the propaganda and is declared to be a Catholic country. Joan says, yes, a Catholic country, as much so as any other state, be it ever so mighty or imperial. In addition to this, we had in mind to draw more closely the bonds of duty and friendship which connect you and so many thousands of Catholics with the Apostolic See. In fact, the maths of the Catholics understood how salutary our action was uh, destined to be. They saw, moreover, that it accorded with the usage and policy of the apostolic see, where it had been from earliest antiquity, the custom of the Roman pontiffs in the exercise of the divinely bestowed gift of the primacy of the administration of the Church of Christ to send forth, forth legates to Christian nations and peoples. Uh, to whom do the pontiffs send legates? To missionary countries? No. To Protestant countries or people? No. To heathen countries or people and nations? No. To Christian nations and peoples? How did the papacy find out that this was a Christian nation to which he could send a legate? Why? The Supreme Court of the United States said it is a Christian nation. And no sooner had it done so then the legacy was commissioned and the delegation was sent and established here permanently. The legates who supplying his, the Pope's, so this is going more the quote, um, the Pope's place make correct errors, make the rough ways plain and administer to the people confided in their care, increased means of salvation. His authority will possess no slight weight for preserving in the multitude a submissive spirit. Then telling what he will do with the bishops and how he will help 
them and preserve their administration and diocesan affairs, it says this is all done that all may work together with combined energies to promote the glory of the American church and the general welfare. <clears throat> it is difficult to estimate the good results which will flow from the concord of the bishops. So this is again quoting, our own people will receive edification and the force of example will have its effect on those without who will be persuaded by this argument alone that the divine apostolate has passed by inheritance to the ranks of the Catholic S. Episcopate. Another consideration claims our earnest attention. All intelligent men are agreed, and we ourselves have with pleasure intimated it above that America seems destined for greater things. So Joan says, you see, he is watching America for these greater things in view of the times to come. So he again continues quoting. Um, now it is our wish that the Catholic Church should not only share in, but help to bring about this perspective greatness. We deem it right and proper that she should, by availing herself of the opportunities daily presented to her, keep equal step with the Republic in the march of improvement at the same time striving to the utmost by her virtue and her institutions to aid in the rapid growth of the states. Now she will attain both these objects the more easily and abundantly in proportion to the degree in which the future shall find her constitution perfected. That is the church's constitution. But what is the meaning of the legislation, legation, um, that is Satali's position, of which we are speaking, or what is ultimate, what or what its ultimate aim, except to bring about, what is its ultimate aim, except to bring it about, that the constitution of the church shall be strengthened, or discipline better fortified. Um, so Jones goes on. He says, "There is the whole situation laid out. The church sees herself in need of a new formation, a new molding of machinery, and of." the framework by which she carries forward her work and imposes her doctrines and dogmas upon the people of the earth. The United States is leading the nations and she joins herself to this in view of the times to come and by reclothing herself, remodeling herself, intends to use this nation as the chief agent in her schemes. Here is a most forcible figure of this in the letter from Rome, before quoted from the Catholic Standard of November 3rd, 1894. Now to the mind of Leo XIII, so receptive to the broad and fruitful ideas of Cardinal Gibbons, of Monsieur's Ireland and Keene, Europe is going through a process of casting off its slow, slow, sloth. I'm not sure what that word is. Um, how to pronounce it anyway. <clears throat> Europe here relates to the papacy as the chief of all, and she proposes to cast off her slow as a snake cast off its skin. And applying the argument and allowing the papacy to speak for herself it is a very appropriate figure because the scripture says that she is actuated by that old serpent. It is correct. And she casts off her old, rough, worn skin and is coming out in such a new skin, so beautiful and so rosy that thousands of Protestants think it is another thing altogether. But God says it is the same old serpent, whether it be in the same old skin or not. It is the same old serpent in her new skin, working the same way for the same purposes, for bringing the nations under her hand. And she now proposes to do it and will do it. We must read a few more statements and make a few more comments. I read from the Catholic Standard of November 3rd, 1894, as follows. There is an awakening, a metamorphosis, uneasiness, and hope. The tradition is that in ancient Rome, there were such expectations while the tragedy of Golgotha was being enacted. And even now, mysterious, mysterious voices may be heard announcing that great Pan is dead. What new order will arise? Will humanity be once more its own dupe? And will the old evils appear again under new names to people the world once 
uh, to people of the world once more, uh, to people of the world once more with false gods, who knows? The idea suggested there that nobody knows what the answer will be. Now he tells. What we do know is that the world is in its death agony. It is not time that Seventh-day Adventists knew that thing full well too. Is it not time that Seventh-day Adventists knew that thing full well too? And we definitely can see that today, right? And that's where the papacy comes in. So the papacy knows that the world is in its death agony. Do you know that? If you know it, it is not your place to tell it. Is it not your place to tell it to the world as well as the place of the papacy to tell it to the world? What has God given us? What has God given us this message for all these years? But that we may show that the world is in its death agony and that we may tell the people so that they may turn to the author of life and be saved when the agony brings the last result. The papacy knows this and she is acting in view of it. I will now read the rest of the sentence. What we do know is that the world is in its death agony and that we are entering upon the night which we must inevitably which must inevitably precede the dawn. Of course we are. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, the morning cometh and also the night. In this evolution, the church in the eyes of the Pope has a mission to fulfill or to fill. This is the view of times to come. What is she looking for? A world in its death agony. All nations uneasy, society um, racked, everything going to pieces as it is. The papacy sees all that is going on and expects it to go on until the finish. And we know that the papacy has done a lot to actually bring about the situation at, that exists in the world, right? To destroy economies and so forth. And out of the agony of uh, agony and the tearing to pieces that come with it, she expects to exalt herself once more to the supremacy over the nations as she did of old. And she's going to do it. We know that. The scriptures point that out. She sees precisely what we see. We see the world in its death agony. We see society racking itself to pieces. We see thrones trembling. She sees that too. And she proposes to exalt herself um, upon what comes through all this at the end. We see that coming. We know she is going to do it. For her triumph comes out of this death agony. She gains new life herself and then glorifies herself upon it. Living deliciously, saying in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the God who judgeth her. We are not then, are we not then, in the very whirl of events that bring brings that thing before the world shall stop? We are in it. The world is going on. What are we here for but to tell the people that the world is in its death agony? and to call upon them to flee to him, who is the life of all. Has not the papacy had experience in just that thing? Has not the papacy seen practically the world once in its death agony? The Roman Empire was the world. All civilization was embraced within its limits, was under its control. She saw the Roman Empire go to pieces. She saw universal anarchy there. As as the world then stood and then was, she saw the world once in its death agony, and out of that death agony of the world, she exalted herself to the supremacy that she had in the dark ages and wrought the mischief that cursed the world so long. She sees the same elements working again, the same movements again going on among the nations, and she congratulates herself. We did it once. Once I rose upon the ruins of that thing, I will do it again. That demonstrated to the world in that day that it was superior to all earthly things. This will demonstrate to the world in this day, large as it is. I am, and there is none else beside me. I shall be a lady forever. I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. That is her tone. That is what she is watching for. And God has opened this up to us in the prophecies that are before us. And he wants to call 
he wants us to call all the people that the world is in its death agony. She raised herself upon the ruins of the death agony of the Roman world. And after the pattern of her experience, she proposes to do the like thing now. She will succeed, that is certain. And it is likewise certain that her success will be her certain ruin. And therefore, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So we should be able to see here that Jones has it right. Now, the thing that I, I find interesting is we look at the parallel that, that Jones had in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin with the idea that, that the image of the beast um, has been made. And now he's saying really that we're in the time of the Sunday law. And, and we could look back at that and we would say, well, Jones isn't correct. The Sunday law didn't come. But our perspective of the time that we're in is limited. It is, especially as I get older, I, I start to see these spans of time as, as, as much more connected than I did when I was a child. I remember, must have been 1971 or something, and I heard on the radio there was somebody saying that the world was going to end in 1975, and I was thinking, well, that's a long ways away, you know. Um, you know, it's like four years, but to me, it seemed like a long, a long time. Or I remember uh, sitting with my brother Dave watching TV, and uh, there was a commercial about a Maytag washer that had a five-year warranty. I'm saying, wow, that's a long time. That's like the age of my younger brother Peter. You know, um, so obviously, as as we when we look at things from God's perspective, quickly. Can we not see that we're really still in the same time that Jones was in, that the events that were happening in Jones' days relate to the events that we see happening around us now? We should be able to see that. Yes. But, you know, people will say, oh, that was a long time ago. We were teaching that Jesus was coming soon. But Jesus isn't coming soon. There's no Sunday law in the works. Now, of course... The key to this is going to be not so much the knowledge about what the papacy is doing, about the politics, because Jones is going to show that the answer to this for us individually is the gospel, the everlasting gospel, right? So we know that Adventists at times have been caught up in what's happening in the world. I mean, I remember pastors in, uh, you know, the 1980s and 90s um, who were, you know, really into all of the current events. And, <clears throat> and they often talked about them in Sabbath school and their sermons. And nothing wrong with that. But it, it's just not the knowledge of what's happening that's going to... Uh, preserve us in that time but it's the knowledge of christ of the gospel knowing him <clears throat> so um we're going to see as we go through this he, he, just like he did with the 1893 general conference bulletin he starts with these current events and then moves into the gospel he's going to do the same thing here in this series in 1895 So, um, any thoughts about what we have read? I mean, he, he's laying a foundation here that's quite important. And, and, and his purpose is to awaken Adventists to their mission, right? So, so Jones has this understanding of righteousness by faith that, he knows has come from God and has been endorsed by the spirit of prophecy. And he sees the situation in the church, that there's this lack of interest. And so he's pointing out the time that we're in, the condition that, that this world is in its um, death agony, right? It's death throes. And yet, 
in, in this time, in when Jones is, the church is, has all this infighting. If you read Ellen White's uh, testimonies at this time, what's happening in the church? I mean, the church is not doing its its work. Now, the 1889 General Conference brought um, something to Adventism that, for a time, seemed to stir it, awaken it. And and these events, the 1888 uh, Blair Bill and the 1892 uh, Chicago World's Fair, just like 9-11 or 1989 in our time, have this, this initial sort of shock, but it wears off. It can't be sustained. And, and so we need to understand this message. And so the message that Jones is giving here in 1895 is the message for the day. It is the thing that, that we need if we're going to be united with Christ and united with each other in doing a work upon this, upon this world. And if we're going to give a message to stir Adventists, we have to have the correct message. And we have to have that message in us. Not, it has to be seen upon us. Christ's character must be seen upon us. Having intellectual ideas is, isn't going to be sufficient. These things are going to have to affect us. So that's the journey we're on in as we continue to read Jones. Any any thoughts? Hasn't been a lot of discussion here today, but <clears throat> okay. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study. Thank you for the Sabbath that's coming, at least here. And, um, and we pray for each person that your angels can watch over them. We ask that you can speak to our hearts. We can see our need of you and that we can trust in you, depend upon you. We know, Lord, that we are sinners. And we live in this world of sin. We are sometimes brought down by it. Sometimes we're discouraged when we look at ourselves. But we know, Lord, that if we look to you and trust in you, that you can lift us up out of this pit. Help us to depend upon you. May the Sabbath truly be a blessing to each one. And um, we pray for the camp meeting coming up in July and the plans of the various people who have contacted me and are seeking ways to to be there. We just pray, Lord, that you can guide and direct and help me in the part that I have to play and um, help each of us as we invite others uh, to this camp meeting. Um, we pray, Lord, that your message can reach our heart, our hearts, and those of others. We give all things to thee and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.